to part two of this three-part documentary on the compact disc revolution. In part one, I talked about the history and the development of the compact disc itself by Philips and indeed the cooperation they had with Sony and the launching of the compact disc onto the world market. But I also talked about 20 different CD players showing how that development happened over time. And so obviously if the CD player that you wanted to see wasn't in there, please put it in the comments. Lots of people have, and it's a very interesting place to go to to get extra very important information. But here we are in part two, because at the end of part one, I kind of raised the question, could a 30 year old CD player sound anywhere near as good as the modern day current ones? And could, for example, a CD player work well as a transport into a modern DAC. So thinking about that, I thought I would set up actually quite a serious comparison between different players. And I invited some friends to come over for a listening session individually and under quite a strict, shall we say, blind conditions. So how did it work? Um, because if we're going to take this seriously, we have to make sure that the testing was also seriously. So what I did first of all was to get a selection of machines. So we had the, the Riga, the new up-to-date Riga Saturn, and then we had the Cyrus, uh, top of the range Cyrus, then the old 1989 Philips, and a 1993, exactly 30-year-old quad, and then the very new, brand new Philips little machine for 49 euros and the project at the back, and of course, a little CD MP3 player, CD compact disc player. And I thought, well, would these things, if we compared them side by side, would they sound different? How different would they sound? Because some people say, well, all CD players sound the same, right? Well, so what I did was I got hold of a test disc, which I remember being sent to review and it's called the Ultimate Audiophile Test Disc um, and it's directly mastered from a 24-bit 96 kilohertz master copy and on this disc there's obviously all the usual sine waves and chorals, choirs and drums and all different things where you can test out your system. It's quite good, it's a double CD and I just grabbed the um, one kilohertz track at minus 18 dB one kilohertz track and basically I selected my Musical Fidelity M8 preamp. I set it at, you know, a fixed uh, number of 70. And then what I did was I measured the voltage at the back of the drive cone, at the back of the loudspeaker, for each CD player in turn. So for example, this one was about one and a half dBs louder than this one and this one was more or less the same as that but the CD Walkman was a good uh, nine decibels quieter than the others when using the line out but in that way I could measure all the differences and I could calculate how much we would have to cut the volume and increase the volume as we switched from one machine to another because that's really important even the slightest increase or decrease in volume in a comparative audio test and that will actually bias your opinion. Generally, if something is a little bit louder, it will sound better. That's the general rule of thumb. So be careful of that when you're doing it at home. So the other thing I had to make sure was that they were all connected with the same type of cable, because obviously that's an extremely important thing. So I raided my friend Maxim's shop here, and we got a whole load of AudioQuest cables, all exactly the same type, hooked them all up, to the Musical Fidelity Pre. Now, what I did was, I did it in such a way that no one could tell which one was which input. It was impossible. And the other thing I did was, I made seven identical copies of the test tracks that we were using. And I'll put the test tracks in the description below so you can see what they were. Because we had quite a nice selection from Beethoven's Fourth uh, Symphony right the way through to Dizzy Gillespie 
and Diana Kroll and Jackson Brown and Willie Nelson, etc. So this also meant that my reviewers, my, my testers, if you like, could select tracks that they thought were really useful to, for telling one apart from another. And one of the ones that came up quite a lot was uh, Tracy Chapman's Mountain of Things, because that was very quite stable throughout the track, but also there's lots of interesting details to listen out for on that track. You might want to try it. Anyway, so basically what we did was we got all the machines set up. They didn't know anything about the setup, of course. I just invited them to come at a certain time. They were each given their own unique uh, uh, formula, um, form to fill in, an, an evaluation form, where we asked, first of all, the fundamental question, could I hear a difference between the two? And they could say, yes, strongly agree to the statement or not. Um, could I hear a difference between the two? And then there was a number of attempts, things like, um, was it brighter? Was it warmer? Was it more musical? Was it more bass, more treble? The soundstage, was it wider? Were the instruments clearer and separate? So it helped people focus on different aspects and they might then say, oh, Harley, can you play that again? Can you just check? I want to check this. So we ended up getting quite a good, accurate feedback from that. But what I did was I had secretly numbered each of the machines. Now they didn't know, so I would start off by saying, okay, I got them all started, and that was a, a job in itself. And luckily the Cyrus <laughs> remote control uses the Philips uh, codec for communication. So actually I could start one, two, three, four, five machines all in one go. So it was only the other, others that I had to sort of fiddle with to make sure that they started at the same time. So all of the machines were playing together. And then I said, well, okay, now I'm going to play you CD number one. And they listened to CD number one. And I said, now I'm going to switch to CD player number two. Of course, they had no idea which one was number one, which one was number two. And then they had to listen to the difference. And then finally, they had to choose the one they liked best and explain in the forms what they preferred about them. So a lot of people, for example, chose CD2 over CD1. And that meant we then compared CD2 with CD3 and CD and whichever one they preferred until they got to the end, of course. So we got started. So let me introduce you to the people I brought in because obviously over the weeks, I really got to know how these machines sound myself. And I will in part three select the Cyrus, the Riga and the project. And I'm going to do a detailed review, um, not only about the different how they sound, but the sort of the functionality and the design concepts behind them. And then eventually at the end of that one in part three, I will have a summary of the whole sessions and tell you which one I prefer to keep here in the listening room. Anyway, back to the tests. So the first person we brought into the listening room was um, my friend Dries. And Dries is part of the Pearl Acoustics team. He studied acoustics at university. He's 24, so he's young, he's got good hearing. Um, he's also a trumpet player and a percussionist. So he regularly plays live music and studies at the Music Academy. But he's actually someone who really listens to music. So when he was in the listening sessions, he was listening to the track of Dizzy Gillespie, for example, and just hearing it twice so between the different machines and not really listening like a sound recording engineer or maybe an audio file would listen. So that was very interesting to get his feedback. The second person I brought in um, was Pierre Nicholas. Pierre Nicholas Schmidt is a sound recording engineer. He studied re sound recording and post-production at the University of Brussels. He's 29. We've worked together a lot of times. A lot of the CDs that I have recorded and been released on various labels have been um, post-production, mastering, mixing, editing by Pierre Nicholas. So he has an extremely good ear. That doesn't necessarily mean his hearing is perfect. It is very good. But it means that he's trained 
to hear the subtlest and tiniest details. Sometimes in a recording you hear the most minute little sound or even I don't hear it but he hears it and he zooms in on his system and he zooms in and zooms in to identify exactly where it is. Is it the violin? Is it the harp? Is it the cello? Where is it the, the, the lighting system in the hall? And he will zoom in, isolate that sound and try and remove it one way or another. So the, he's someone who's working full-time every day more or less in sound engineering and he was a, a great person to have. And each of these tests took at least two hours, two to two and a half hours. We had a break halfway through because that was very important. And then finally I brought in my friend Martin and Martin is, um, studied psychology at university. He's the oldest of the three. He's 31, still young enough to have very good hearing. He plays classical guitar, studies at the academy, and also plays an electric guitar. And he's made these uh, wonderful little you, uh, small movie clips. I'll, I'll put a link to one. Uh, he, he's also a, a great lover of cats, as you'll see in the picture here. Um, but Martin, you will also know him because he was the, the guy who mastered the first Avalyn Graham CD recording I made uh, and, and also the Aurora Decess and Avalyn Graham CDs that you can get on the website or listen to on, um, on Spotify. So he did the mastering for that. So he's also experienced, very experienced at sound production and editing and listening to the minutest details. So those were the three people I had. Well, how did they get on? Well, surprisingly enough, they found it difficult to tell between certain machines. Now, Pierre and Nicholas found no problem at all through nearly all of the machines, except for when it came to the quad. The quad and the Cyrus. Now he didn't know which ones they were of course but he said well you know these ones are really difficult to tell apart um, and it's quite interesting because um, both uh, um, Martin as well really really liked the sound of the quad and he said oh that one sounds really musical very nice I like that and it was very strange because I'd read the reviews from when the days it was re released and it was described as being very musical and he liked them very much with this and he actually really struggled to tell them apart. Pierre Nicholas told them, tore them apart because he, he could identify them because on the Dizzy Gillespie track there's some tape noise which Pierre Nicholas calls white noise of course and he says yeah you know the sound of the white noise in the background on the sound stage I could just hear it was a little bit wider and more evenly balanced between on the Cyrus than on the quad. And generally, he preferred the Cyrus. And so did Martin. He chose them out of all the way through. With the Cyrus was the one machine, again, they had no idea which machines they were listening to, was the one that they finally chose. Now, Dries, on the other hand, it was very interesting because I started actually comparing the Philips here with the compact disc CD player the mobile one and this CD has a very sort of warm sound it's slightly rolled off in the top and it's not extremely detailed it sounds nice I mean it sounded good to be honest for 49 euros it sounded nice but it wasn't very detailed whereas this one was much brighter the instruments were clearer wider defined and so these two were fairly easy to tell apart but and everyone chose this one over this one, without doubt. But the interesting thing came that the next one up, we then compared this one to the Philips C880. Now the Philips C880 is a machine that the Philips engineers were kind of battling with Sony at the time, 1989, and they wanted to make the very best CD player they possibly could, sounding the most incredible as they possibly could and obviously the Philips management kept coming along and saying oh but we want this feature and we want repeat and we want program and of course the sound engineers at Philips were not interested in any of those silly marketing gimmicks they just were interested in the sound but in the end of course the management wins and so you ended up with this 
panel of lights and things and I have switched it off through the video because it you can see that it flickers it interferes with the lighting on on the camera but this was their answer to the best Sony at the time and it has a copper interior you know isolated mains separate power supply for the different areas it, very high quality components and there are people saying on various uh, forums that this is the very best sounding machine that Philips made and or certainly quality wise in terms of construction and everything and that from then onwards they had this CD880 as their kind of bench model by which they would compare all the future models and that if they made a, a, a some change for mass production or reducing costs they could use this model to compare and saying does it still sound as good does it sound better does it sound worse is it acceptable well that's what I've heard um, and from Erwin and he's a very reliable source and is on websites as well um, uh, and, and Erwin was working at Philips and he's lent me this machine very very kindly lent me the machine so it's a very interesting outcome um, but the, the interesting comparison between the Philips and the CD player here, this bright player here, is that the Philips was also very, I can't say bright, it was very defined, very neutral, all the instruments nicely laid out. So when the people were listening to the CD player, uh, the, the Walkman, um, and they all said, oh, yeah, I like that. It's nicely separated. And they heard this. They went, oh, yeah, now this is very nice. So it sounded very similar. But in fact, I suspect it sounded a lot better because there's just less distortion. And it's never been serviced over the 30 odd years. Um, it, it apparently, so 33, 34 years old. Um, but it just sounded nice. It just sounded natural and great. And I think that was an interesting thing. And Dries liked that, and he stuck with it till the very end. Um, and that is also where the difference came between this one and this one, which sounded much warmer and, and sort of more musical, if you like, maybe more vinyl-like, more analog. Um, but I'm not going to let you know which one I preferred until Mark III, until Part Three, because I think that's going to be interesting because I want to look at the Riga in detail and the project in detail as well. Now to the second part of the testing. After the testing was done and they'd had a break and I'd re revealed to them which was the one that they had chosen and they were shocked generally. Uh, they, they all thought they were chosen something completely different from the one that they had. I actually took the coax out of some of the machines, again without them knowing, and put the coax into the project DAC here, which is a, a, a dual saver, dual mono construction, very high quality. And I put that into that player and we listened to the CD again, of course, playing with using the players as transports and everyone agreed everyone agreed that there was little or no difference between the different machines and I had a Sony um, DVD player which had a coax out because unfortunately this has a coax out but it was only for video I didn't realize when I bought it whereas the Sony 100 euro Sony had a coax out and when you switch them across there was a slight difference in the volume level, so I had to adjust for that. Um, but generally, everybody said, oh, they all now sound the same, because obviously it seems to be that it's the DAC and the analog converter, the digital to analog converter, that is creating that last preamp output, is really creating the sound characteristic of the machine. So I think the theory is, or the summary for this is, as long as the device, regardless of what method it's using, is collecting all the data and presenting that data to the DAC, it really will be the DAC and the clock within that DAC that's really going to make the difference to what you hear. And the sound characteristic, whether it's warm, whether it's forward, whether it's sound stage is impacted, whatever, 
is really determined by the DAC and the uh, digital to analog converter and that little preamp out, that little preamp stage that brings the volume up ready for your preamp to amplify off to the power amp. So that was really the summary. So my advice is if you are on a budget, certainly, and you see a lovely CD player and it's secondhand, and when you put your CD in without it connected to anything and you, you don't hear any noise, you don't hear it going tick 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 or whirring around or whatever, and it, and it opens nicely and it closes nicely, then actually, as long as it's working and the laser's working, you can just use the coax out and pop it into one of today's modern DACs and you'll get the sound of what that DAC is, I mean, and the, and the output of that DAC. And that means everything becomes less critical. Of course, the modern machines tend to have really nice DACs, but I did find it ironic that back in 89 and in 93, the sound was fantastic too. So that is the conclusion really of, can an old player sound as good as a new one? Yes, it can. Did my panel choose new ones over the old ones? Yes, they did. But if we use the coax out, then, and into a really good modern DAC, then that's where the story changes. And that's where I'm going to see you in part three, where we're going to look at the Riga, the Cyrus, and the Project, the top of the range ones, together, comparing them in detail, and I'll give my conclusions on that. Well, I hope you found that interesting. I hope you found that useful. And until the next time, enjoy your music regardless of whether it's on CD or vinyl or whatever medium or streaming, just enjoy the music. After all, that's what it's all about, right? Having fun. Thank you.